2016. Uh, what I'd like to point out about this election is that I am worried that this long experience with this with stagnation, which is longer than we had before 1980. So there was this great boom in the 60s, and maybe about 10 years or 11 years of the stagflation experience after the recession of 1969 through 1980. But this is longer than yet that, by almost 15%. And then even in the Great Depression, you had, okay, the Great Depression for about 11 years, then World War II, whatever that was. I mean, it's not economic recovery by any stretch, because you know, there were no real goods being produced. But still, I mean, the Great Depression per se was like 11 years. Well, the stagnation lasted about 40% longer than that. Is that the point where the consciousness of this nation starts to become a little addled? and a little atrophy, and they start losing their own confidence and losing their own clarity. Is the nation demanding economic growth? It sure did in 1960. That's empirically brutal. Is it demanding an end to the high levels of un and underemployment and the debasement of currency? It showed signs of that, but I'm not going to read the electorate in 2016. Is it demanding that? Is it clearly did? That the apex of the two, the, the troughs of the two period, previous crises. Well, if that's the case, uh, then there really has been an insidious effect of this stagnation. It, it has got at the American people. Um, and that means, of course, that if that's so, and I hope it's not so, because that would be a new kind of American people that we haven't seen before in this nation's 239 year history. <coughs> if that's so, then that means the obligations of leadership <coughs> are greater than possibly ever. Because leadership has got to get the American people to discover who they really are again. It's like, yeah, we are a people of constant success. We're not failures. We succeed. That's what Americans do. Not like a few, like many, many, many. And that's the task of leadership, it would appear in 2016. Now, I would prefer, I have to tell you, that the American people would force the politicians to see the light, but it might be that the those running for office have to hold a mirror to the American people and get them to realize who their true selves are. That's a very unusual predicament for the American electorate to be in. I can't really think of any clear cognates to that situation in American history. Um, but it puts some pretty serious stakes on the American election. So that's a few comments on some of the details the election in light of the supply side tradition in 2016. So, so as I was mentioning at dinner, uh, the uh, one thing that every Republican candidate knows, and this certainly includes Donald Trump, you can see from the way he acted in his first couple of statements in Boulder, the Boulder debate, um, every Republican candidate knows that they have to get the uh, approval of the supply siders, of the classical supply siders. They know, at the very least, that if they get uh, negative publicly stated reviews from the classical supply siders, their candidacy is completely over. So they know if Larry Kudlow, Arthur Laffer, heck, sometimes even me, that if these people say, uh, oh, this person is not a recognized supply sider, their candidacy is over. So every single one, and I've done a lot with a lot of them, every single one is done to every one of the old supply siders and say, can you give me like, your blessing? Every single one. Okay. And you'll notice the Boulder debate, First thing out of Donald Trump. Donald Trump, who doesn't listen to anybody, right? First couple things out of his mouth. Larry Kudlow likes my tax plan. Larry Kudlow likes my tax plan. Larry Kudlow likes my tax plan. <laughs> First thing, which is a signaling mechanism. The electorate, okay, this is consistent with Reagan conservatism. Um, so, that's good. Uh, that, at least, Pavlovian reaction still is operational. Um, now that Marco Rubio is probably the one with the tax plan that worries the supply siders most of all. He actually uh, has challenged the supply siders a little bit about not cutting the marginal rate very much and increasing tax expenditures, term coined by John F. Kennedy's Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Stanley Surrey, to ridicule the way that exceptions are written in the tax code for marginal rates, preventing you from the cutting marginal rates and therefore more efficient allocation of capital and economic growth. He's in favor of them uh, for children Steve Martin, the comedian, always said, you know, whenever, when you're in trouble, just start talking about children, you know, and the, ch and the children. Um, so, now, of course, I mean, this is not to minimize or belittle uh, the predicaments of raising a family these days, this day and age. And that is what you have with 1.9% growth. Yeah, you get real 
you know, real problem uh, in, the, in the family. The family is a microcosm of society, and uh, you know, poverty has its uh, temptations. You know, this, you know, it wants you to be frugal and all that, but you know, families are uh, the first thing the families model to society, of course, is, is abundance. And that's what families are by definition. They're nothing. That they're, they're hard. There are abundance, abundance of self giving <laughs> of being there for the others. And it's just an abundance. That's what families are. They are just a little representation of heaven here on earth, right? Heaven's like super abundance of everything that's good, and that's, you know, that's So the idea that, you know, we marry families with economic privation is, you know, it's going to be a problem just kind of theoretically. And when America's already shown that it can produce abundance economically, and then doesn't, that's going to produce cognitive dissonance. So, uh, some of the other candidates, they're virtually all cutting marginal rate. I mean, even Rubio's cutting marginal rate income tax by a couple points. But then all of them are taken down by, because marginal rate income tax today is 42.5%. And I think that after Rubio, it takes it to 35, they're all going to take it down to 25 or less. So, that's good. Um, the next thing that the supply side is always said, supply side is always talking about fiscal policy and monetary policy. And they say you got to solve your economic growth problem for fiscal policy by cutting marginal tax rates. And you solve your currency problem. Nobody has confidence in your currency, inflation, whatever. There's a bunch of hedges, a bunch of people going crazy with financial instruments on Wall Street because they have no idea what the value of the dollar is going to be. They have all these hedges. That's why oil went up after all, 110. That's why gold went up to 1800, because those are hedges against currency. When you ask a gold trader on Wall Street, happened upon a bunch of documents that a young uh, Goldman Sachs currency gold trader in 1981 wrote at the Donald Reagan papers in the Library of Congress. This was Lloyd Blankfein, who's currently the CEO of Goldman Sachs. Well, he was on the gold desk at Goldman Sachs in 1981. Look at those papers. They're there for anyone to see. All he says is that gold is a hedge against what the investment community thinks the United States is doing with respect to managing the dollar. And that is universally the opinion in the gold markets about what the price of gold is. <coughs> okay, so the price of gold is low and stable, stays there low. That must mean that the worldwide investment community thinks that the dollars run just fine. So what you want to do is conduct monetary policy such that the private price of gold, unmanipulated in the private market, stays low and stable. This is exactly what I told Janet Yellen, and he invited, she invited me and five other conservatives to come tell her what our perspective was in her office last February. You can read my entire remarks to her on my Forbes.com com column, column from uh, that time. So supply side is what I was talking about, that marginal tax cuts, that increases growth, that increases the demand for the currency, and then once you have real demand for the currency, you can just reestablish a link to gold, and then you, all your problems are solved because the economy takes off at 5% growth per year. When you have 5% growth per year, everyone gets rich, the government gets small, and you know, America's America. Because I mean, the United States have 5% growth runs for yeah, decades on end. For most centuries, the vast majority of the centuries of its history, but the decades of its history. So that's where one would think the Republicans would go in 2016. Um, now, I've talked a lot about Democrats tonight, too. I've talked about John F. Kennedy and Bill Bradley. And uh, before 1980, uh, there really was no significance outside of Andrew Mellon's Demo Republican tax cut tradition. Republicans had always been the inside players, right, the Whig Party before them. They had always said, well, no, 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 I raise some taxes, either the income or the tariff, they're okay, because we're well connected and we can get attentions from them. Uh, it, the Republicans took a lot of learning um, and it was always the party of the little guy who said, no, 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 we need low tax rates, especially on the rich, because then that devalues exemptions. And then you had this weird meeting of the two parties when the Republicans finally realized this in the 80s and the Democrats still thought that in the 80s, you had, that's when you had the great bipartisan consensus. That's why it's, I actually think it's one of the greatest, one of the greatest catastrophes. If I did like maybe name one thing, was the greatest catastrophe in the modern history of political economy. I meant to say it's, it's George Bush's tax increase in 1990. Because if that 28% tax rate had held, I think not only would we have the 28% tax rate, but there would have been this solidified bipartisan consensus that would become part of the American baseline to this day. Well, we have a lot of work to do because that was 26 years ago. Um, and this incredible onus of leadership has fallen on the Republican candidates this year because you're not going to get Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton. Uh, so 
this incredible onus of leadership. And I'm, I still have something a weird, crazy, completely unfounded hope in Elizabeth Warren. In that, look, if you're really, if she's sincere, and she's probably not, but if she's sincere about the little guy, then she can channel her in a real Bradley if she really wants to. But whatever, we'll talk about that when she becomes vice president. You're well and thick too. But uh, this incredible burden of leadership is falling on the Republicans. Americans are starting to forget who they are. They're starting to forget that there are people of economic growth, that mass success is in the DNA of this country. And it's going to take leadership to remind Americans of who they are. It's usually the people who have to remind the politicians, put the politicians in their place. So those are the petty little stakes in 2016 from a supply side perspective. And I uh, would like to remain cautiously optimistic that it will all work out. So thank you very much for having me.